Dr. Rao, uh, welcoming you, sir. Thank you for coming on the last. Uh, Dr. Pradeep was called in yesterday because uh, Dr. Mukund, uh, who was to come, uh, uh, actually has fallen ill probably with COVID. And uh, he, he... Thanks for inviting me, Tushar. Uh, Pradeep, thank you so much for coming. Uh, Dr. Pradeep Rao, I, I, I don't have a formal introduction of him. He's a urologist, of course. And uh, he has been a regular participant at QED and a winner of at QED. Uh, QED, as you know, is our quiz. Uh, that we do a juxta med quiz. A brilliant, brilliant fellow in more ways than one. And uh, also, uh, he uh, runs a f food block. Can I say that? Yeah. He has a food block, which I'm is... lazy, so it is intermittent. But it's there. It's called Intrepid Gourmand. Intrepid Gourmand is his uh, food block. E excellent food block, especially, especially if you're a non-vegetarian foodie. I think you should uh, read his blog. Excellent uh, reviews of... Multinational. Intrepid Gourmand. Intrepid. E I N T R E P I D. Intrepid Gourmand. G U G O U R M A N D. Yeah, he is. Uh, he is a proud foodie, <laughs> and uh, international um, connoisseur of good food. Uh, so yeah, we. Prashant, uh, of course. Uh, sorry, Pradeep, of course, was extremely happy. Extremely happy. Uh, not to be invited, that I don't know, but extremely, <laughs> extremely happy that there were no slides that he had to prepare and that it, it was just an interview lecture. So I think, uh, <clears throat> okay, Pradeep, I'm just finding your sure. slide on this. <clears throat> okay. Uh, so, I uh, have a group practice, I head a group of five urologists and uh, we offer urology services at various hospitals. Most of my time is spent at Global Hospital where I am the head of the department of urology and uh, most of my group members are there. I also provide, uro our group provides urology services at uh, Reliance Foundation HN Hospital, Jupiter Hospital Thane and in SRV Hospital Mamta. So we are doing an experimental group practice which has been working for the last seven or eight years. Oh, wow. I have not heard of a super speciality group practice of yeah, such a long it's time. It's uncommon in it's Mumbai, uncommon. but it's working so far. So we are five of us at this present moment and so far we are working well. Uh, so we sub-specialize. The advantage of having uh, group members is that although all of us do most of the things in urology, we tend to concentrate our practice in a... Uh, subspecialty based like BPH, stones, cancer, transplant, so that uh, we get better and better at one thing rather than being a generalist and a jack of all trades. And we find it's working very well so far. You know what they say about such super specialists? Yeah. They know more and more about less and less till they know everything about nothing. <laughs> Yeah. But in this case, it is about <laughs> surgery. Yeah, so, yeah. you know, in OPD, we see all patients, but we try to concentrate the surgeries among uh, some yeah. of us. Okay. Uh, so, what is your area within urology? Where you Mostly cancer. Mostly cancer. Uh, okay. uh, cancer, robotics, and laparoscopy. Okay. Yeah. Great. Uh, but also because we have a very busy transplant program and because my expertise in robotics, I do, I'm the only robotic transplant surgeon in uh, this state of Maharashtra. Wow. Okay. So, we do uh, robotic recipients. But and my uh, primary work is cancer. Okay. Uh, what is your group called? Advanced Urology Mumbai. Advanced Urology Mumbai. Okay. Yeah. Great. We'll be sharing all the contacts, Dr. Aditya, Nishant Aditya, uh, and everything so that, so that uh, you know, if we need them, yeah, when we need them, we can use them, use their services. So, uh, we are discussing, uh, of course, our subject is invasive uh, diagnostics and interventional neurology. We'll take one topic uh, after another sure. and... In between... Uh, Just one thing, Tushar, when you called me yesterday and told me, I thought it was a very interesting uh, topic. And one thing I always say in medicine is that there's no point in doing an investigation unless it's going to lead to doing something about it. Correct. So that's why the previous speaker, I don't know, he must have left already. Uh, uh, Nishant is outside. Uh, he, he said that uh, you should screen relatives, first order relatives of people who had a... Subarachnoid. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, are you going to do anything about it? So he said, yeah, he said, if a subarachnoid hemorrhage relative, sibling, 
has a more than 3 mm aneurysm which has not ruptured no pass history you should still stand uh, coil them is that's that, what he said is yeah. that the standard of care well he said that i don't know because i had uh, i this was a question that i had already always been in my because mind. you know we had uh, one gentleman who was also into interventional neuro uh, doing interventional neuro stuff uh, he's a neurologist who was doing interventional neuro and he had the bright idea of screening everybody in the opd for carotid plaques okay <laughs> <laughs> my question was are you really going to yeah. do something about no, this i think i think uh, this probably is valid i am asking kumar to just go through the uh, evidence he yeah. will tell us immediately because ct ngo is uh, it's invasive, invasive exactly in, in, and in, in you're giving contrast so yeah. i'm not I, I i don't know the evidence so the what we'll have to know is the figure of absolutely per but annum what is the rupture rate and once i get out of here i'm going to find out from somebody you have somebody I, yeah means uh, friend of mine is a prominent radiologist i want to ask him his opinion yeah yeah <laughs> no, no, i thought you had a sibling who had a perianal rupture my father had a cranial bleed yeah so does that mean that i need to get screened for a very aneurysm bleed no we don't know that because he presented with a stroke elderly 70 at, then probably not mm. yeah okay uh, so we'll go uh, first we'll discuss stones because this is the commonest situation that okay. they they have kidney stones and as we know what we physicians do is see the size of the stones we determine whether we can conserve or not in the first place and if we think we cannot conserve we refer so uh, what stones can they try to conserve that is the first step so uh, i'll tell you if if on incidental ultrasound finding this 2 mm or 3 mm stone just ignore it it doesn't exist most sonologists will report fat also as stones they are just to be ignored you don't even have to think that might keep the mic a little yeah. closer 2 to 3 mm stones reported on an incidental ultrasound which is done for something else just ignore them don't kidney even look stones. at them kidney, yeah, kidney stones. stones kidney stones uh, so if the stone is anything larger than 5 mm it probably needs to be followed up i'm talking of kidney stones not ureteric stones it probably needs to be followed up as long as it is not symptomatic and it's very unlikely that any 5 or 6 mm kidney stone or smaller is the cause of any symptoms in fact even a larger calicial stone is extremely rare to cause symptoms so the first thing i have to convince patients when they come to me that this symptom of yours whatever imaginary pain you have or a real pain musculoskeletal pain is not caused by your kidney stone kidney stones by and large do not cause pain what causes pain are ureteric stones because they block the ureter the ureter is a tubular structure which distends and that's what gives rise to the pain a ureteric stone uh, needs some intervention medical or surgical most ureteric stones 5 mm or below will pass and ultrasound is not the primary investigation to do in a patient who comes with ureteric colic what you need to do in a ureteric colic is a plain ct scan kub never ever contrast all you need is a plain ct scan kub i get a lot of patients coming to me with a contrast ct it's completely useless because the once you do a ct iv or a contrast the radiologist never bothers to document the plain properly and then we can't even see the stone because once there's contrast you can't see the stone so never a contrast ct never a ct iv what we need is a plain ct scan kub if you get a patient with a classical ureteric colic just send him for a ct scan don't waste time doing an ultrasound send him for a ct because a normal ultrasound does not tell you that he doesn't have a ureteric stone because the patient might be dehydrated with vomited a couple of times there is no hydronephrosis and the ureteric stone cannot be seen so plain ct scan kub is the primary investigation the gold standard and standard of care today anybody presenting with a ureteric colic if the ct scan shows that the stone is below 5 mm in size 90 to 95% of the time it will pass all you need to do is supportive treatment which is diclofenac when there is pain in ure acute ureteric colic what works best is an injection vovran or diclofenac so this is what you give and this should relieve the pain buscopan is the other one which works but this is not easily available so you don't get an injection buscopan otherwise uh, evidence wise that's the other thing which has been shown to work so give them diclofenac if they have pain not otherwise and you can give an alpha blocker that is tamsulosin 0.4 mg twice a day if the stone is in the lower third of the ureter tamsulosin does not work for stones in the upper two thirds of the ureter 
So anything below the iliac vessels, then you can give tamsulosin because that will help the stone to pass. There is no evidence showing that it helps in stones in the upper two thirds. So, uh, but five millimeters, six millimeters also, six millimeter will pass about 80% of the time. So, you know, these are the stones which will pass. And unless the patient is a diabetic, you can wait even a month and two months just with medicines when required and alpha blockers. These are the only two things needed. No Lasix, diuretics retard passage of the stone. No IV fluids, no hydrotherapy. Just ask the patient to drink adequate amount of water. Adequate is about two liters of water in a day. Plus other liquids, tea or coffee if they have. But you don't need anything more than that. You don't need anything more than that. Up to two liters of water in a day. So as long as they don't have persistent pain, they are fine to wait. Persistent pain, any fever with high counts is an indication for immediate intervention. Or if it's a diabetic with pain and fever. You cannot wait in these patients. And diabetics, they get pyonephrosis like this. You can't wait. So if it's a diabetic, extreme caution. You can wait for a week maybe, but I won't wait longer than a week with an obstructing stone in a diabetic. But non-diabetics, you can wait two months, three months, no problem. As long as they're pain-free, they're fine. Nothing's going to happen to the kidney. But beyond two, three months, then I would suggest the stone is still there, you need to take it out. And once you do a CT, you can follow up the patient with an ultrasound, as long as you know the stone is there. Only if you have a doubt or the sonologist says that I'm not sure the stone is still there, then you can repeat a CT. I can't remember when I last asked for an IBP. I, we do a CT IVU when we need to define the anatomy, which is rare. It's not in stone cases usually because the plain CT gives you an excellent delineation of anatomy. And if the cortex is good, his creat is normal, although I know the creat only uh, evaluates one kidney function also. By and large, uh, we assume the kidney is functioning well and we don't do a functional study. About what size should they immediately send for intervention? Surgical so, intervention. if it's a uretric stone above 8 or 9 millimeters in size, the chances of passing are less. They're not zero because 9 millimeters may be lengthwise and widthwise on a CT, it may be 2-3 millimeters. In which case, it can still pass. But I wouldn't wait more than a week or two weeks in such cases because beyond that, it's less likely to pass. But, uh, and if there are two stones together, even if they're 5 mm, they're next to each other, they're less likely to pass. They don't allow the other one to pass. So, those are the cases where which require intervention. But it's always worth giving alpha blockers in lower uteric stones below one centimeter just to see whether they'll pass. The other thing is in women are much more likely to pass these stones because the eight or nine millimeter stone will not pass through a male urethra, but it'll pass a female urethra. So in women you can wait, a non-diabetic patient with a lower uteric stone which is bigger. But in men, this stone is not going to get past the urethra. So anything above 8 millimeters in a man, I think it needs to be taken out. It's very less likely to pass. What are the, what are the various options in, say, the lower ureteric stone, upper ureteric stone? So now that we have one size fits all. Ureteroscopy removes all stones. Okay. It removes ureteric stones, lower, upper, kidney stones, calicial stones, everything. Unless you have a kidney stone which is larger than 1.5 centimeters, ureteroscopy takes care of everything. Okay. We call it RIRS when we do it in the kidney. We call it ureteroscopy in the ureter. But it's basically the same procedure. You pass a scope, laser, you powder the stone and it's done. If it's in the kidney, you use a flexible scope. If it's in the upper ureter, you probably need a flexible. If it's in the lower ureter, semi-rigid. But the procedure remains the same. So we'll make it a little basic for all of us. Yeah. First of all, what is a flexible ureteroscope? And it is, is it not the uh, automatic uh, scope used? No, no, By no. Default. Flexible ureteroscope is uh, a relatively newer procedure. Uh, it's been around for the last 20 years or so. It only came into effect when we had an energy source which could be flexible. The earlier energy source to break the stone was a steel pneumatic probe which used to act on propulsion. So by definition it had to be straight. So all our ureteroscopes were straight and they were made of steel and they were uh, rigid or semi-rigid as you would say because you could bend them off because they had fiber optic uh, fibers inside to visualize. But they were semi-rigid. So they won't bend. So what happens is the kidney is back here. Your urethra is on top. So when you go in through the bladder and the ureteric orifice, you are looking up and the kidney is down. So unless you have a ureteroscope which can bend, you cannot see kidney stones. So you can tackle stones in the lower ureter and upper ureter but not in the kidney. 
So then when the flexible ureteroscope was developed, it can, like a gastroscope or a colonoscope, you can have it looking up and down. Now, the new ones we get have a 270 degree deflection either way. So you can access all parts of the kidney with it. And the best part of the flexible ureteroscope is it has the same diameter all the way. See, with the semi-rigid ones, they are much bigger at the bottom than at the top. So as you go in higher and higher in the ureter, the big part of the ureteroscope enters the ureter. And this increases the chance of an avulsion because the ureter will grip it rather tightly. The narrowest part, part of the ureter is, a, uh, is the uh, vesicotric junction, which is two millimeters. You can dilate to a certain extent, but our ureteroscopes can be three or four millimeters at the base. So when they go in, they put a lot of stress on the ureter. In some patients, it dilates well. In some patients, it grips. And sometimes you come out and the whole ureter is in the endoscope. You don't want that. So it's risky to do a ureteroscopy in the upper third in every patient. But if they're flexible, because they're the same diameter all the way, it's easy to pass it all the way into the kidney. If it goes through the lower, it'll go up. So is, uh, why doesn't it become the default ureteroscope? So two reasons that initially when they came in about 20 years back, the, a lot of urologists who were old senior urologists who started using them were not used to them. They used to break these scopes. So the original published data, even as late as 2007, 2008, was an average number of users per scope was 10 to 15. This published data. Average? Number of users per scope. Okay. And for a scope, which cost a minimum of five to six lakhs. So then your cost per procedure was very high. And at least in Bombay, most hospitals would quail at this sort of cost per procedure because just the scope costs you. And you know, it's, it's, if suppose it's a six lakh instrument, 10 users, 60,000 per use. But sometimes you knock it off in the first case, your six lakh is gone in one case. Now what we have is that, of course, we have expertise. Uh, so I've been doing the procedure for 17 years. In my hands, I get 80, 100 cases out of the reusable scopes. So it brings down the procedure cost. That is one. Second thing is for the last three, four years, we have a lot of disposable scopes in the market, which have significantly brought down. So this procedure has become more common in the last three, four years because everybody is using them. The risk of damage to the scope is less. So as a family physician, should they request a urologist to use a flexible scope? If no, I think you should leave the decision to the, to the urologist. urologist. Okay. Yeah, because uh, he will dis see. You may get a urologist who is not comfortable with the use of that. In a surgical practice, it is best the surgeon does what he is comfortable with. Correct. Okay. And what he can safely do and get the patient. No, out. we have a choice of sending to another surgeon. But that's that's your choice that you choose somebody who is adept at all procedures so that he can provide the best possible treatment. Would you recommend them that upper two-third or upper one-third stone? It is definitely better if a flexible is available in the OR. See, what we do is, we always start with a semi-rigid. You will always start with Start the with a semi-rigid scope. Semi because it's so much cheaper. Okay. But once we find the ureter is even slightly tight, we immediately move to the flexible. Switch. We don't, yeah, we don't uh, uh, wait on that. And that is important. That option should be available to me. Correct. It would happen in the past that this option is not available, we would keep trying and you end up with a problem. That should never happen in this day and age. So it's best to do it with somebody who has a laser and who has a flexible okay. because he will use it when required. So now we'll just go back to the uh, stone. So you have passed a ureteroscope, you have a stone which is 10 millimeters in the upper one third. What happens to the stone? You break it. So we have, uh, if you're using a semi-rigid, we have two types of instruments. You have a pneumatic lithotripter or you have a laser. And nowadays, most people, because they have the laser with them, they'll just use the laser. The laser will powder the stone. There are two types of laser we use for this, basically. Holmium laser or thulium fiber laser. So this laser tends to dust the stone into small fragments, which are less than two millimeters in size. So once you're dusted, then a lot of them will clear with the irrigation when you're operating. And the rest, you put a stent in because you have instrumented the ureter. You need a stent up to 48 to 72 hours at least. So you put in a stent, you take it out after three, four days, and the patient will pass the rest of the fragments. Because the stent is needed, so the patient will be hospitalized twice? No, the stent mole should be done in the outpatient department with a flexible scope. It should take one minute. It should not require any admission. Okay, but the sec it requires a flexible scope for stent removal? So... If you use a flexible scope, you don't need a lithotomy position. Correct. For instance, wherever I practice, we do the stent removal in the outpatient department. He doesn't have to go to the OR. 
it saves them a lot of money. Okay. And because they are the flexible, uh, they are lying down supine and very comfortable and pain free. So no anesthesia required. So the procedure takes one or two minutes. Uh, now if you are doing the same procedure in the OT, you need to get admitted for half a day or a full day. You need anesthesia because they are going to put a lithotomy position and it's uncomfortable for you to sleep in a lithotomy. And you are going to get a semi-rigid cystoscope pushed up the urethra which is very painful. So all this requires a GA. So this is very important that you get a flexible cystoscope to take out the thing because it's a lot more comfortable for you. So this is very important. Stent removal, if done with a flexible uh, scope, patient does not get admitted and the cost, because the cost of readmission and stent removal itself is 10 to 20, 000, 10 to 15,000. That is extremely conservative. Which is un <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Uh, so, uh, so I think that is one thing that you should keep in mind when you refer to a urologist. Not every urologist has the facility for a flexible and therefore See, maybe outside of India, this is standard practice. Nobody will ever imagine doing a stent removal or a cystoscopy with a rigid scope. It's only in India this practice still continues, unfortunately. So, but I, I've been preaching for a long time now, but everybody doesn't get on board. Yeah. So, anesthesia also, you know, you have to give twice yeah. to this patient because of the removal of stent. Okay. Uh, so, this is the uretroscopic removal uh, or of, a stone. of yes. the stone. Any other methodology, what extra uh, ESWL, what is ESWL and so why is it used? So ESWL is uh, extracorporeal shock value of the trophy. It's one of the true medical miracles of the 20th century. ESWL came before all these things. And when it was developed, uh, because somebody in the company, Dornier, saw glass panes shattered by the Concorde. And he said that sound waves can break this, but they don't touch anything soft. So the ESWL machine was developed by Dornier in the late, early 80s. And you know, you just lie down, that time it was in a water bath and now it's just a balloon which is kept on your back and sound waves break the stone. The theory being that they do not damage any soft tissue, just break the stone. So this is of course great. I obviously have access to an ESWL machine, but we use it very rarely nowadays for a few reasons. Uh, first, ESWL in older patients is a bad idea. Uh, you give kidneys ESWL beyond the age of 50 or 55, they can get pericapsular hematomas and there have been reports of increased incidence of diabetes and hypertension following ESWL oh. because the pancreas is next to that. So that is one thing. Second thing is that younger patients, of course, ESWL works best in calicial stones where there is some urine around the stone and the it's safely inside the kidney. It doesn't work well in PUJ stones or ureteric stones the results are far inferior. If you go below the upper ureter, the results are dismal. It's below 50%. How do I explain to a patient that he's going to get an operative procedure which has a below 50% clearance? It's hard. Calicial stones, it has a good clearance rate other than in the lower calyx. The middle calyx or upper calyx stone has an 80 to 90% clearance rate. But we have data now. The most important thing in using ESWL is your Hounsfield unit has to be below 800. So on the plain CT scan, if the HU is below 800, the stone is in the pelvis, upper calyx or middle calyx, ESWL is an option. Uh, just explain, Hausman units tell us the density of the stone. Of the stone, so on CT scan. On a plain CT scan, the, uh, the radiologist will report the Hounsfield unit, that is the density of the stone. And if that average density is below 800, ESWL is a good option below 1.5 centimeters and below 800, upper calyx, middle calyx and pelvis. Not PUJ, just pelvis. If it is blocking the PUJ, it's not going to work ESWL. Because in that case, what happens is there is no urine around the stone. It's impacted at the PUJ and these don't break well. It needs some water around it for breaking. But upper calyx, middle calyx and pelvis, uh, below 800 units, ESWL is definitely an option, below 1.5 centimeters and Below 1,000 units, also you can do it. Above 1,000 units, this stone is never going to break. Not with the lithotriptors we have currently. See, what has happened is that the HM3, the original Dornier lithotriptor, had extremely superior results. But the patient needed to be immersed in a water bath and he required full general anesthesia. So as the years have gone by, the lithotriptors have become more compact and no water baths and no anesthesia. But they've also become less effective. 
in treating stones. So what lithotripsy they have currently work best under these circumstances, a house field unit below 800, size below 1.5 centimeters, because the larger the stone, the lithotripsy will break it, but you need to pass all those fragments and it's extremely painful. So anything below 1.5 centimeters is a lot of burden for the ureter and they end up with a Steinstrasse, which is a column of stones in the ureter. So below 1.5 centimeters, below 800 units and uh, upper calyx, middle calyx or uh, pelvis. Lower calyx stones have a success rate of 60 to 65 percent. So if the patient is very keen and he understands that this is going to be a failure in the case, there's a possibility, then you can give it. How many sessions? I would say any stone would require more than two sessions, not worth doing. Not worth doing, okay. Yeah. So I would give one session. Most of my stones when I give ESWL, I expect them to clear in one city. Otherwise, okay. I wouldn't give ESWL. And after I give it, at the most, I would risk a second session. I wouldn't give any sessions more than that. So extracorporeal shockwave lithotripsy, as you understood, uh, very rigid criteria for trying to use it. Also, this will also require stenting. So no. No? Never. How do they pass? They pass the ureter. No, Achha. you break into fragments. So what we do when we give ESWL, and it's important that the urologist be present during the ESWL rather than a technician. See, I can use the highest power of the machine to break the stone. But breaking a one centimeter stone into four or five big fragments is no use to me. They're not going to pass. He's going to require a ureteroscopy. I've converted one operative procedure to another. So the best thing is to give gentle shocks at a lower thing. The idea is to dust the stone, to get it into small fragments below two mm so that they pass without any pain. So it's all right to give more shocks at less uh, intensity and then maybe risk a second sitting rather than try to give, break the stone all at once but end up with a blocked ureter. Why does ureteroscopy with laser require a stent and this does not? Because the ureteroscopy has instrumented the ureter. So the act of passing an instrument up the ureter and dilating it a bit, there is edema. Then those fragments will not pass because this. So actually ureteroscopy doesn't require a stent beyond 48 hours. No stents work beyond 48 hours and we get the American stents which we use have a thread. So in doctors, in educated patients, I keep the thread and ask them to pull it out. Oh, okay. Ah, but but uh, some doctors are even come to make me pull that out. Yeah. So I wonder whether it's <laughs> worth it. But yeah, if, if the doctor is well motivated, you can. And... Uh, you don't always need a stent for ureteroscopy, okay. but the patient has to understand that he may get a colic because of edema. So sometimes rather than get up at night, for me it's better to put a stent. Okay. Uh, so that you know for two, three days I'm not bothered. <laughs> no, stricture chances are very low unless you have ruptured the ureter, in which case you need. But you know a stone which has not passed naturally is not going to come out with that device also frankly. The ureter is narrow below. So we don't try because the chance of avulsion, trauma is all much higher with this. We used to use a basket earlier to hold the stone so we could break it. We don't need that as a laser because the laser there is no retropulsion. The stone remains where it is and you can break it. With the pneumatic lithotripter what used to happen, the stone would get propelled up. So we'd use a basket and umbrella to prevent it from going up. Yeah, hydronephrosis on itself is just a function of the stone being there. Once the stone comes out, it will clear. <coughs> I told you already, one to two to three months, no problem. No pain, you are fine to wait. But the patient should be following up. You don't want him coming back one year later with a non-functional kidney. Patient should be, you know, amenable to regular follow-up. Otherwise, you will find that he doesn't come. Two, three years later, he comes and the kidney is knocked out. You don't want that also. Dr. Cooper. He's asking so, about steroids as part of medical expulsion. So deflazacort has been reported to be useful. Personally, I think that if you look at the evidence, tamsulosin is the only drug only which drug. works. So you should use tamsulosin and I know because the combinations happen because pharma companies make more money on a combination than a single drug. Dr. Kumar actually will tell us the evidence, but there is zero evidence for steroids. 
now for nifedipine or amlodipine the only medical expulsive therapy that is approved is tamsulosin in fact the meta analysis shows that tamsulosin also doesn't help so a lot of people in the us Achha. have stopped yeah but but if you go through the meta analysis in detail the mm -hmm. publication which rubbish the use of medical expulsion therapy they clubbed all stones into one okay. upper third middle third lower third and if you looked at the data within the lower, data lower, the lower, lower third, third ones it was working and because they added the upper third where it has no rational for working correct so i have argued this on our medical forums a lot that why don't you split up into lower they don't want to do that because they have vested interests everywhere yeah because a lot of urologists want to say that you need to remove the stone immediately so you know the yeah, yeah. yeah. Ay ayurvedic medicines no i mean uh, unless there is a medicine which has been proven to work in a randomized trial against a placebo i won't trust any medicine if you prescribe it to a patient because the patient trusts you there is a placebo effect of 20% with any drug so you know the body's natural uh, response is to push out the stone so it's not the tablet which has done it the body which is trying to push it out या आई एंड वैसे भी दो तीन महीने निकालने हैं तो वो नीरी लेके निकाले तो भी चलेगा डॉक्टर सुबह सुबोध सुबोध है क्वेश्चन द वेजाइकोट्रिक जंक्शन द वेजाइकोट्रिक जंक्शन वेर द यूरेटर गोज थ्रू द ब्लैडर द इंटरम यूरल पोर्शन इज टू मिलीमीटर दैट्स द नैरो वंस इट ग्लोज इन टू द ब्लैडर द यूरेथ्रा इज अबाउट ट्वेंटी टू थर्टी फ्रेंच इन मैन with again a narrow part at the navicular fossa which is just before the meatus so anything below 8 mm men should pass women can pass up to 1 cm but don't be surprised if the male urethra get something stuck of 6 mm also because it depends on what alignment it comes out in which one alkalinization acidification of urine so alkalinization helps if it's a uric acid stone in uric acid stones you can chemically dissolve the stone so if you know a patient who has high uric acid uh and has a stone alkalinizing may help for sure otherwise it has no role and acidification helps in a patient with a triple phosphate stone who has infection and who needs acidification because those stones are alkaline But otherwise again no role is there any intervention which is not very invasive for staghorn calculi no no stagon calculus there is only one single treatment that is pcnl no other treatment is going to work for stagon and you can't leave stagon alone correct if he is 75 or 80 and asymptomatic maybe but no other age group i would leave a stagon alone it's too so much so stagon calculi without infection without symptoms should be operated yeah absolutely okay so uh, so you know theoretically time solution should not cause postural hypotension but i have seen a few patients very few not like earlier with terazosin what we used to see a lot of patients terazosin i have seen patients infecting also with the uh, uh, hypotension. hypotension but uh, time solution a few patients don't tolerate it then you can bring down the dose to 0.2 bd and if that is also too much you can give 0.2 once a day most patients will tolerate 0.2 once a day uh, the number of patients with postural hypotension or headache with tamsulosin is very small i would say less than 5% of the patients we give uh we go to the next topic uh so any diet so, as long Let as the stone is inside medical huh? areas of stone uh, because that some is something that i have some capacity okay. of teaching no problem so uh, we'll we'll stick to interventional uh, 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 procedures ha uh, devish yeah so that is uh, the thing that if there is a stone inside for a long period of time like a stagon we are worried about the patient developing a squamous cell carcinoma ha huh? whatever size but 3 4 mm usually we don't uh, treat uh, regular follow up if they are not increasing in size you can leave them alone very very negligible i would say the risk of the removal of will be more than the risk of malignancy we will
these are the two which are proven evidence wise to reduce pain and colic Ketorolac, is it available? Yeah. So, Ketorolac is US FDA approved because they yeah. don't have diclofenac. We have diclofenac, we prefer diclofenac, but we can use Ketorolac diclofenac. Tramadol is not recommended for pain relief of kidney stones, as far as I know, uh, because unless the patient has high creatinine and can't be given NSAIDs, you choose buscopan first. We do yeah. get buscopan here now commonly. And uh, if you don't get buscopan... Buscopan is hard to get, no, but it no, was not available in between for some now time. Now we have. Now we have. The uh -huh. brand name has changed. So then, you know, buscopan is a very effective. It is uh, shown to work and you should try it first because it's less harmful than diclofenac. And it can be given intravenous also. Buscopan. The reason we don't use tramadol is because one of the symptoms of uretic colic is nausea and vomiting. And tramadol also causes nausea and vomiting. Correct. So you may be aggravating the situation by giving that. Uh, we will go to the next topic, which will be uh, lower urinary tract symptoms and related surgeries. One is... You can use something like Drotaverin, which is a smooth muscle relaxant. Drotaverin, Drotaverin, antispasmodic. Cyclopam, Drotaverin, all this stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, About LUTS, uh, first of all, Eurodynamic studies. Mm -hmm. In which patient should they order a Eurodynamic study? As you know, Eurodynamic study is a inv uh, mildly invasive diagnostic procedure. Uh, and we are not very familiar with it. I don't know if we have recently uh, recommended any patient for a UDS directly without a urologist getting involved. So what is the role of their... What I said in the beginning, that unless it's going to change... The therapy. management, there's no point in doing urodynamic. Therapy. I think the decision to order a urodynamic is best left to the urologist. We very rarely need to order a urodynamic, but when we do, it is essential. Okay. But these are all complex cases. It is day-to-day -day cases, you very rarely need a urodynamic. A patient who has lower intact symptoms, who is an elderly male, about the age of 50, the prostate starts enlarging from the age of 40. That's a natural process of aging. Radiologists are taught to write enlarged prostate for everybody above 40. So you get enlarged prostate and the patient comes, I got enlarged prostate, 15 grams. So there's nothing, but the radiologist is trained. In mm -hmm. our medical college, they're actually trained that when you give a report, if he's above 45, you have to write enlarged prostate, no matter what the size is. So you will see all patients are enlarged prostate. It doesn't mean anything. Symptoms are everything. We treat symptoms, not the gland and not the patient. We treat symptoms, not the gland, not the patient. Lower urinary tract symptoms, if he has, you treat the symptoms. This is the most important thing to understand. Don't treat a report. That is why the urodynamic report is less important. When do I use a urodynamic? If a patient of Lutz, an older man, who has a small prostate, who's not improving with medical treatment, alpha blockers, because today 80 to 85% of patients will get better with medical treatment. He's not getting better with medical treatment. He has a small prostate, he's miserable. That's the patient who needs a urodynamic because I don't know whether surgery will cure him. Please understand that surgery for the prostate relieves only one type of obstruction. Patients have lower intact symptoms because of two things. There is a static obstruction which is caused by the size of the prostate, which is by sheer physical presence that it has narrowed the urethra. And there is a dynamic obstruction which is caused by the smooth vessel fibers which are around the trigone and the bladder neck and the uh, prostatic urethra. These smooth muscle fibers can be negated with alpha blockers, that is tamsulosin, alfuzosin, psilodosin. So when the alpha blockers don't work and there is a small prostate which means there is no static obstruction, this is a patient who needs a urodynamic. A patient who has had a surgery for the prostate by any other colleague of mine, and the surgery has failed, means he is still back with the same symptoms. He is the one who needs a urodynamic. Because I will not intervene a second or third time in a patient who has been operated previously without checking why the guy is in trouble. So in prostate patients, when do we do urodynamic? When you cannot explain why. Suppose a guy is 80 gram prostate, median low, severe symptoms, no improvement on uh, uh, alpha blockers and reasonably high PVR. I don't need a urodynamic in him. I know that he needs surgery. He's not getting better without surgery. So urodynamic is what is going to tell me. It, it may introduce an infection which will delay his surgery. 
Eurodynamic, don't take it lightly. It's an invasive test. It has an extremely high chance of infection when done by the best person. Oh. Extremely high chance. Because of catheterization. Yeah, because they're putting a tube in and they're running water. And you know, our uh, sterile practices in India are shady. Even at, with the best hands, your chances are high of having an infection. This person probably already has retention of urine. He has high post residue. He may have a reflux or something going. And then you are introducing fluid from outside. So, there is a high chance of an infection in any urodynamics. I would request never ever get a urodynamic which is done by a technician. You need a urologist to do a urodynamic. Where is uh, it done in Mumbai? According to me, Dr. Anita Patel is the best. Where? Uh, she does it at uh, her clinic at Shivaji Park and she comes twice a week to Global. Okay. She is by far the best person because you need a thinking person doing a urodynamic. There are a few other people who are doing it. Uh, I think Dr. Vinod Joshi does it at Hinduja. Who? Uh, he doesn't do urodynamic. He's a very close friend. He doesn't do it. Anjali Bosley does it at uh, Chambur. And uh, Dr. Sujata Patwardhan does. My recommendation is Anita Patel. She's excellent. No, he doesn't do urodynamics. Urodynamics is done by very few people in Bombay, urologists, and they are the only ones who should do it. Uh, we have one uh, urogynecologist also who does it, Aparna Hegde, okay. who does in female patients. But you know, uh, get it done by a specialist. It's worth it. Depends on the patient, right? So in a patient with BPH and LUTs, you are looking to see if the voiding pressures are high, if there is involuntary contractions. So if the voiding pressures are high in a patient with a small prostate and uh, severe obstructive symptoms, it tells me that he may require surgery if he's already on alpha blockers and not getting better. Uh, in a patient with a residual gland after previous surgery, again tells me that the gland is causing the problem. Because you know, you, if a urologist has done a job already, you don't want to automatically doubt he has done a good job or not. You assume that he has done a good job, but if the urodynamic shows that there is a res high voiding pressure residual, then you know there is a problem. No, that the pre urodynamic assesses the pressures. The interpretation is up to you. It will just tell you that these are the pressures. And only two components of the urodynamic meet, mean anything. One is the uroflowmetry, which is the basic part which we do in patients with all LUTs, male or female. And the other is the systometry, which is the bladder pressures. The others don't mean anything. UPP and all are completely useless. They have no uh, uh, this thing. Then urodynamic is important in children with voiding dysfunction. It will show you who is a dysfunctional voider. It will show you who has DSD. So many things. But again, uh, the decision is best left to a urologist because it's a complex test and there's a chance of introducing infection. Yeah. Uh, about prostate next. What are the less invasive surgeries for prostate? When do you use laser or you know, the other okay. modalities? So, you, you know, uh, B, the treatment of BPH is now multifold. Uh, the gold standard remains a TURP. Uh, where you uh, uh, go in with a resectoscope and you take out chips of the adenoma and resect the adenoma completely. For the last 15 years or so, we have not done a conventional TURP. We do bipolar TUR, where the cautery machine we use is different. So we can use saline as a fluid instead of glycine or water. So the chance of a complication is almost gone. So bipolar TURP, I would say today is the gold standard. Other than that, we have other minimal invasive therapies. You have HOLEP and THULEP, which is laser enucleation of prostate, which works for bigger glands. And we have robotic uh, removal of simple prostates, which works for very large glands. So in my unit, because we have expertise for all, below 60 grams, we do a bipolar TUR. When the patient requires surgery, it is very rare these days. Most patients are handled medically. Between 60 to 120 or 60 to 100 grams, we do a laser prostatectomy. And above 100 or 120 grams, we do a robotic BPH because that gives the, these we have found give the patient the best outcomes. Remember one thing that uh, in a patient with uh, anything uh, above 50, you can use dutasteride for up to six months. There is zero role for dutasteride or finasteride below a 50 gram prostate. There is no evidence that it helps. 
I see a lot of patients coming with Urimax D, Celodol D, thoughtless and written by unfortunately many of my colleague urologists also who have not read the evidence. Below 50 gram there is no indication to use a 5 ARI, means finasteride or dutasteride. Between finasteride and dutasteride, dutasteride is far more effective. Dutasteride gives the action in one month what finasteride gives in six months. Oh. And beyond six months of dutasteride, there is zero benefit to using it. But if a patient who is on long-term dutasteride develops prostate cancer, he tends to develop an extremely aggressive variant. So my suggestion is if you are giving dutasteride, give it for a patient with symptoms who has a gland above 50 grams, but do not continue beyond six months. There is no point. Just move to a plain alpha blocker. Again, I'm not a fan of combination. Just use the se tablet separately and stop the dutasteride when you want. What is the maximum size reduction given by dutasteride in six months? About 30 to 35 percent you can re size reduction. reduction. Yeah. And a stopping dutasteride after six months does not cause the si no, size to go not back? Really. Not really. No. Okay. No. But there's no benefit beyond six months. Okay. Mm. And remember a patient on dutasteride you have to automatically double his PSA when you do the PSA. So if a patient on dutasteride has a PSA of 2, it is actually 4. So be careful with that. Any patients on dutasteride or finasteride, you have to double the PSA if they've been on it for more than a month. So patients with high PSA, we prefer not to use these drugs if you're following up just the PSA. Because then it uh, falsifies the result for you. Urimax D. For years, I have seen them. That's why I'm trying to tell you so that you don't give that. Six months. So after six months of say Urimax D kind of drug, just if the, if the LUTS lots are similar, same. You will uh, advise surgery. What what grammage of prostate? No, you the advise decision surgery? for surgery in a BPH is uh, uh, it's a very complex decision. It's not I try to based? avoid surgery as far as possible. Achha. There are some certain concrete indications for surgery for the BPH. Recurrent retention, recurrent inf infection, UTI, hemichuria, and any complications of the BPH like forming vesicle stones or back pressure changes. Or back pressure, back pressure changes. changes. If you don't have any of these, it's very hard so to recommend repeat, surgery for BPH. repeat the indications for BPH surgery. He said recurrent retention, so AUR, acute urinary retention. But one episode of acute urinary retention is not an indication for surgery. You catheterize, if it is not too large, start alfuzosin in two days, take out the catheter. If he passes urine, he's fine. Because over distension can lead to retention. You get the rainy season coming, people put on the AC and go to sleep. If they have slept very well, they had a couple of drinks at night. By the time they get or up they in the morning. Or they have taken anticholinergic drugs and they get... Oh yeah, any of these. So... One episode of retention is not an indication for surgery. But repeated retention is definitely an indication for surgery. If somebody comes to me every two months with retention, he's better to operate him than not operate him. So one is retention. Second is recurrent, recurrent infection, he said. UTI, yeah. So post-void residue causing infection and recurrent infection. There is no reason any man should get a UTI. Any UTI in men is pathological. And any UTI in a woman is hygiene related unless proven otherwise. So if a man has a UTI, there has to be a pathological cause. Men just do not develop UTI. There has to be some reason. There has to be a reason. That is why in a child, the first episode of UTI in a male child, you need an MCUG. But in, not in girls. In girls, a UTI, you teach them hygiene and make sure that they don't get it again. You don't need an MCU. So American uh, Pediatrics, uh, Academy of Pediatrics, first episode of UTI in a male child, indication for a system, MCU. Similarly, first episode of UTI in an adult male. Has ultrasound to be investigated. Has, has to, to be investigated. investigated. Ultrasound has because to be men just do not develop UTI just like that. Recurrent retention, recurrent UTI, uh, complications of BPH like a stone, vesicle stone, or not kidney stone, hemichuria, recurrent hemichuria, and back Ob pressure changes. Obstructive changes. Back pressure changes. I said recurrent hematuria. No, no. You are talking of clots in the bladder. That is major hematuria. I am talking of patients who have blood in the urine, hematuria. If they are getting it repeatedly, then they need surgery for the BPH. 
to surgery? No, one episode of hemorrhage could have any reason, number of reasons. Recurrent hemorrhage is a reason to get it done. One episode of hemorrhage in a patient with a BPH, you start him on dutastide, the hemorrhage will go. Correct. Then you don't need to do anything for him. So what post is residual is not by itself an indication for surgery. Uh, if it is more than 300 ml persistently, then I would think of a urodynamic to see why he has it. And then if he has high voiding pressures, definitely surgery is indicated. But below 300, I won't worry too much about it. Just tell the patient to do double voiding and he should be fine. Yeah. Okay. Uh, anything more that they should know about pre-operative or post-operative prostate surgery care of the patient? So patients with a pacemaker, they require either a bipolar or they require a, a laser because the bipolar, the pacemaker should not get affected. Monopolar is a complete no-no for those patients. Uh, patients on aspirin, uh, we don't stop aspirin nowadays for surgery, for TUR at least. Uh, some people may still insist, but actually it's not required. Patients with aspirin and clopidogrel, the recommendation is to stop one of them, preferably clopidogrel, at least four to five days before surgery. Uh, you can safely do a laser surgery especially a thulium laser in a patient who is fully anticoagulated. So it can be done. We have done them regularly and it can be done also. So it's not a reason to stop anticoagulants if the patient needs it. So you need to discuss with the physician how important it is and it can be continued. I would stop clopidogrel though. What is the incidence of uh, incontinence after TURP for example? And I have never seen an incontinence in a TURP which I have done. Okay. So TURP incidence is very low. In laser unicleation, there is some degree of incontinence in almost everybody, which, which can last up to a month. Up to Stress a month. incontinence, yeah. Okay. With a laser unicleation. Because what happens in laser unicleation is we pull the gland a bit and there is a tug on the sphincter. So there's some amount of neuropraxia, which takes up to a month to settle down. Okay. But in a TUR, conventional TRP, it is very rare. And in a robotic BPH, it never happens. Uh, Prostate surgery should not cause erectile dysfunction at all. But the, you should understand that the person who has come for a prostate surgery is already at the age where erectile dysfunction is an issue. Mm. What I tell patients, even of radical prostate, this, because we do now sparing radical prostates for younger patients who need to get, uh, you know, who want to continue their sexual activity. I'm not going to improve their erectile function. What they had before surgery is what they're going to end up with after surgery at best. And at worst, it may go down after surgery. So, you know, it's very important in patients who are asking for this to evaluate their, there is a questionnaire which is called a SHIM questionnaire. You can do a SHIM score before the surgery. Because it's likely that most of these patients have erectile dysfunction before surgery at the age of 65 or 70. Obviously, you're not going to have the sexual function of a 20-year-old. But some patients find it hard to accept. Then they blame the surgery. There's no way that a BPH surgery ever causes an erectile dysfunction. That was sorry. There before. What what did you say about nerve sparing? I don't know what is nerve sparing. That sparings? is for prostate cancer. When we do a radical Achoo, prostatectomy, radical. Okay. the mm -hmm. nerves which give cavernosal nerves which give sexual function, which give an erection, they are on either side of the prostate, uh, going posteriorly. Now, when you are doing a radical prostatectomy surgery, either laparoscopically or robotically, you can preserve these nerves. Frankly, I uh, do better laparoscopic prostatectomy than almost anybody and I do a very good robotic prostatectomy but nerve sparing is better with a robotic. If you really want nerve sparing, if I have a 50, 55 year old, we need to do a nerve sparing, better do a robotic surgery for him because you can save the nerves easier with a robot but even in the best hands, after sparing the nerves, the incidence of uh, normal erectile function is 60 to 65 percent. So there are going to be some patients who may not recover after a radical prostate. It's totally different from a BPH surgery because the, we preserve the nerves. And that is something the patient should understand beforehand. But if you preserve nerves, they are very well retained. The rate. Those who are good erections before will continue to have good erection after. They won't have ejaculation, but they'll have orgasm. So they'll have pleasure, they'll have everything except the ejaculation because we removed the seminal vesicles. Dr. May have a later question. So, like I mentioned, that there are two types of symptoms in BPH, irritative and voiding symptoms. 
irritative voiding symptoms are almost always re <laughs> relieved with alpha blockers, except for one. See, in irritation, you get frequency, you get urgency, you get urgent continence. These are all irritative voiding symptoms. Obstructive voiding symptoms are hesitancy, straining, nocturia. Why nocturia? Because you're not passing the full urine at night, so you have to keep getting up repeatedly. Obstructive voiding symptoms are improved by surgery. Irritative are not improved by surgery. It's a, for obstructive? 100%. Because you're removing the static obstruction. But irritative symptoms may not go, except the one which is caused by a median low. If a patient has a median low, so he's going to have an outstanding result with surgery. Because his irritative symptoms will immediately go with surgery, no drugs will make it go. Because the median lobe inside the bladder keeps irritating the bladder. And the bladder thinks it's full. So he keeps going and passing urine. That will completely go with surgery. But other irritative voiding symptoms like frequency and urgency, they don't necessarily go with surgery. So that's why I'm saying that even after surgery, the patient might require alpha blockers or he might require an anti-muscarinic, like mirabegron or something. In fact, some patients have such irritative voiding symptoms which are severe that you need surgery just to be able to give them mirabegron or uh, detropan or something because then they will not go into retention. Otherwise, with the BPH, they go into retention. That is the urodynamic test, no, I'm telling you. If it tells you that widening pressures are high, then it's going to, surgery is going to have a good outcome. And patient with a poor flow will have a good outcome because the only thing surgery does is improve the flow. If patient already has a good flow, he's not going to have a, be happy with his TUR because his uh, outcome is only improvement in flow. Uh, stress urinary incontinence interventions. Okay. So, uh, this is in women, I assume you're talking. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, again, there is a drug which is useful in many patients, and that is duloxetine. Uh, I don't know if many of you are aware. And uh, what we see in women with stress union contents is only the tip of the iceberg. Indian women do not complain. If you practice abroad, you will get women saying at the end of 45 minutes of hard exercise, I leak one drop and I want to stop it. Indian women can leak a full pad and they will still not come and tell you because they think it is a lot to suffer in life. So, you know, you need to really check with Indian women whether they are suffering and believe me, a lot of them are suffering. You would be surprised, you ask your mother or your sister and they will all tell you that we are, or your wife and they will all tell you, oh, yeah, I leak a bit but it's okay. So, there is a lot of stress and incontinence in women and a lot of it can be reduced by doing Kegel exercise and improving pelvic muscle tone especially before and after delivery also. And uh, duloxetine is incredibly effective in many of these patients. Yeah, so you should try it. Duloxetine. You can go up to 40 milligram BD. We start at 20 milligram BD, move up to 30 milligram, and then go up to 40 milligram. BD. But remember that in 5% of patients, they can't tolerate duloxetine. They'll come back to you within two days and tell you that I'm disturbed and I have psychiatric problem and this and that. You need to stop the duloxetine. So they are idiosyncrasy, 5% of patients. So be very careful with duloxetine. If you tell them before and they'll all imagine they have it. So I don't tell them. I give it to them and they come back in two, three days if they are not happy with it. We use this in men and women. In the men who have stress and incontinence after a prostate, BPH, laser surgery, we commonly use it and they are happy with it. Okay. But... Uh, in women, you can use it for stress and incontinence and it helps. And you, most important thing in women in incontinence is history taking. You need to distinguish between stress and urge incontinence because the treatments are completely different and the treatment for one will aggravate the other. Suppose a patient has primarily urge incontinence and somebody goes and operates her for stress incontinence, she gets worse because using a TOT or TVT will make the urge much worse. What he's saying is, you have to differentiate between an overactive bladder. Exactly. Which causes urge incontinence and a stress urine incontinence, like, like, like sneezing causing uh, urination. You have to differentiate that. You have to ask them, when you laugh or cough, do you leak? Or when you need to go to the bathroom, before you reach the bathroom, it comes out. That is urge. That is urge incontinence. Urge. Stress incontinence, when you laugh or cough. Mixed, yes, but which is worse? And treat the urge first. See, it's easy to treat the urge. It's just a tablet, right? Nowadays, Mirabegron has very few side effects. 
So 50 milligram of one miravagran once a day you can give. If anything more is required, you can add solifenacin to that. So these two together should take care of most urgent continents. You don't need the more powerful drugs like tolterodine and uh, oxybutin in which used to cause dryness of mouth. So these cause minimum dryness of mouth. So use these drugs first. If their urge goes away, you might find the stress is not much. Like I said, women don't complain. They'll complain about the urge because it bothers them. But the stress, they accept it. I'm not saying they should, but that's how most Indian women are, that they accept. So, uh, stress urinary incontinence, if it doesn't settle with duloxetine, may need surgery. You mentioned some surgeries. I don't know the abbreviations that you used. So, TOT is transobturator tape. TVT is transvaginal tape. These have gone into disrepute in the US, but they're still being used in many other countries. Disrepute in the US? Because a lot of tapes which are improperly put migrated into the bladder and ended up with lawsuits. Oh. So Johnson & Johnson had to withdraw the entire product from the US market. So we use, if you can't use them, then you use a rectus fascia or a, uh, abdominal fascia sling instead of the tape, so biological material. So there are many of these where you sling up the urethra and, in, but you know, again, the decision for this surgery needs to be taken by somebody who's a specialist in this. I am not, Anita is very good at this, or Aparna, these are the people who should really decide whether the surgery is required. Because most of these patients get better with medical treatment and Kegel exercise. Correct. Only after all the conservative measures. Any surgery should not be done unless all conservative measures are failed, for whatever the condition. You are talking of LUTs. That is one of the lower in fact symptoms, the poor stream. It can be how thousands of things, no? in men, in women, BPH, so many things. Yeah, that's a lower in fact symptom. That's what we've been discussing all this time, no? For BPH, you, in older men it could be BPH, in younger men it could be dysfunctional voiding. No, no, but prost don't go by reports, go by symptoms. If the patient has a symptom, he requires treatment. The size of the prostate is immaterial. This is what I tell all my patients. You can have a 10 gram prostate requiring surgery, you can have a 200 gram not requiring surgery. Size of the prostate has nothing with the requirement for surgery. Surgery is predicated on symptoms and the things which I told you, the indications, yeah. So, stricture urethra treatment is only surgical. Uh, it can be endoscopic. Remember that endoscopic surgery treatment of stricture urethra has a 70% uh, success rate for the first VIU and 0% for the second and third VIU. So, any patient can be offered a VIU, which is an endoscopic treatment of stricture urethra, once. Second time, I would not offer because it's a 100% guaranteed failure. We are this you, is we are you just uh, a visual internal urethrotomy. Visual where you go in with a cold knife and you incise the stricture and the patient is supposed to pass urine forever. Even that 70% success rate after the first sitting comes with regular self-calibration. So unless the patient is willing and able to do this, never offer a VIO to the patient. Cause of stricture. Most of the time it is infective or iatrogenic. So infective because of any sexually transmitted disease or urethritis or uh, iatrogenic because of a previous instrumentation. Whether it is urethroscopy for stone, whether it's a cystoscopy for anything or a TURP. Yeah. Any of these things? Mira background, Mira background See, 50 milligram. We use either anticholinergics like solifenacin, darifenacin, tolterodine, or we use sympathetic drugs like Mira, Mira. background. I think we'll uh, close here, Vishal. Post EURP stricture is. It's unfortunately fairly common. So the way to prevent it is, of course, you need to do an adequate urethrotomy before putting in the resectoscope. Indian urethras are narrow, instruments are made for western urethras and our urethras don't accommodate uh, the western instruments and we have almost no instruments made for Indian urethras. So we do an Otis urethrotomy which we actually cut the urethra to make sure that we have a controlled uh, uh, incision in the urethra to prevent any fibrosis. So incidence is low if you do this, 
uh, many of the older people don't practice this and the uh, incidence still tends to be high. I think. I said 70% for the first try. After that, zero. I think we'll close here. Dr. Pradeep Rao has been a brilliant speaker and he is known to be an excellent orator. Uh, uh, this is again for sir. Only PSA. And we'll, of course, be posting the contacts. This is for you, sir. The, the insides might interest you because they are vegetarian, but still. <laughs> okay, yeah, QED. Thank you so much again, Pradeep. Thank, Thank you, Tushar. Uh, Even QED. Looking forward. Looking, uh, October, date's fixed. Uh, we have our next speaker already here, and uh, I'm sorry to keep you waiting, Dr. Tejas. Please come. A very quick bio break for them. They have been they have been here for some time.